I am really excited to introduce our next presenter, Ben Forda, Senior Director, Educational Initiatives for Adobe Systems. He is also one of our Culture Source 2015 MASCO speakers. Our series continues at the DSO on June 17th with Liz Lerman. Ben will speak about STEM to STEAM, an initiative that is near and dear to most of our members and many of you who provide related programming at schools for curriculum, related field trips, and as after school programs. Culture Source is involved in a soon to be revealed STEM STEAM program partnership in Southeast Michigan. And in addition to my role as acting executive director of Culture Source, I'm a designer and use the Adobe products, so yay. Uh, research shows that students with four years of arts and music or music in high school average 100 points better on their SAT scores than students with one half year or less. Better scores are found in portions of all the tests, math, reading, and writing. In addition to students with an education rich in the arts, they have higher GPAs and standardized test scores, lower dropout rates, and even better attitudes about community service. These benefits are reaped by students regardless of socioeconomic status, a survey of 400 US-based companies conducted by the conference board showed that 72% of business leaders say creativity is of high importance when they are hiring. The biggest creativity indicator, a college arts degree. Their report concludes arts, music, creative writing, drawing, and dance provide skills sought by employers in the new millennium. And yet we hear most often that STEM, science, technology, education, and math are the subjects that our education system should stretch. Ben Fordham, a self-declared technical geek, he liked that title, is here to tell us why STEM needs to be changed to STEAM, adding the A for arts. Ben, please join us. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's on. Good. Um, good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you for having a conference in my back door. Um, I travel and speak extensively, and this is the shortest commute I have. I live in Oakland County. Um, so with the exception of M14 traffic this morning, it was a painless experience, and it's... it's this, this is an unusual pleasure. Um, I generally don't like starting sessions like this talking about myself. I actually don't like talking about myself in general. Um, but when looking at STEM to STEAM, I'm going to confess up front that I have a bias and a pretty significant one. Um, and so I think it's important to tell you where I'm coming from and the lens that I'm looking through um, because um, I think it's, it gives some important context. Um, as you just heard, I am a self-confessed geek and have been that way all my life, and I'm very proud of being so. Um, I'm the, the kid in school who was happier with his nose in an encyclopedia than on the sports field. Um, I, I actually kid you not, um, I grew up in London, and um, there they play football, you know, the one you play with your feet. And um, my contribution to the school athletics was I was the missing goalpost. I, 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 ki I kid you not, I sat there with my world book, and they yelled duck, and I would move when the ball was coming. Um, and I was the one who you know, had wires and gadgets over the floor, taking things apart, rebuilding things, and always have. Uh, my wife will tell you my office looks the same to this day. Um, but that's what I do. I love technology and always have. Um, and so STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, is something very near and dear to me. Uh, I'm also a teacher. I'm an educator and have been for very, very many years. My first actual paid teaching job was when I was 15 as a, as a tutor, and I've been teaching in some capacity ever since. Um, I don't get to spend that much time in classrooms anymore, um, but I, I teach, I write, and um, professionally, the uh, accomplishment I'm most proud of is I've taught pro programming skills to over a million developers worldwide through books and teaching and lectures. Um, so I spend a lot of time doing both, um, the engineering and, uh, and teaching of it as well. 
Um, and the reason I tell you that is then I'm kind of an odd person to be talking about putting the A for arts into STEM when I'm a STEM person through and through. Um, so how many uh, teachers, educators in this room, anybody, even if, you're, even if you run art centers that, that, that are teaching, we shouldn't, so most of the people in this room somehow touch education in some capacity. Um, the STEM to STEAM thinking, you know, the idea that the A for arts has to be embedded right in STEM. I think they, they would have loved to be able to put it as the middle character, but that M, it kind of doesn't read right, so it kind of got pushed to the side. But the intent was really that arts needs to be embedded right in there and be part and parcel of, of STEM. Um, that's actually somewhat contentious. Uh, there are those in the arts community who don't like that association and worry that arts gets relegated to playing a supporting role in STEM, that you need it to make STEM better. And you know, so let's have two hours of painting on a Tuesday afternoon and there'll be better engineers. And so there is some concern there. Um, and, and valid concern. Uh, I'm not gonna be the one here today to tell you the value of arts and culture and well-rounded education and, and giving um, our children the, a, a platform for their future lives. You've heard that, you're gonna hear it the rest of the day, um, and the reason you're here is you believe so. Um, I am gonna do exactly what is objectionable, and I'm gonna focus on what arts means to STEM and how STEM itself needs arts, and that one without the other doesn't work, and that, that's what employers are actually looking for these days. You know, as educators and parents, um, our job is to make sure we are raising kids who are functional, successful, capable members of society, uh, who can follow any path they want, who can accomplish their dreams, contribute, um, be successful, that's our job. It's an exciting job and a terrifying one. And the, one of the reasons it's terrifying, particularly for educators, is this stat over here, if the slide moves. I queued it up so well, and, nope, there we go. Um, this is a stat from the US Department of Labor that scarily says that 65% of students in school today will end up in jobs that have yet to be defined or invented. Now think about that. We as teachers, our job is to make sure kids are successful doing something that we don't even know what it is yet. Right? Now, so where are the areas of focus? What are we actually gonna focus on? Well, that, that's you know, a little more um, obvious. This is the same uh, Department of Labor, and I promise you this is the last slide with lots of words I don't like. Lots of text on my slides. Um, but the things you'd expect, uh, um, the computer mathematic operations, um, healthcare, technical operations, education, things that need hands-on, need touch, really things that can't be outsourced, offshored, and done by computers and robots primarily. And then as you go down, down the list, less so management, um, business, financial, and then job and office all the way down. Um, so these are the areas, which sounds what you'd expect. Um, and so you would think that even right now, um, our students are well prepared uh, for these um, when, they, when they go into the workforce. And so even though we don't know how to prepare them for the jobs that haven't been defined in the future, maybe we're a step in the right direction. Well, unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, we did a huge study the last couple of years with thousands of educators around the country um, and thousands of hiring managers. And seven out of 10 hiring managers, not just in high tech, across all industries, Seven out of 10 hiring managers agree that students nowadays are unprepared for some of the necessary skills for success. And that's for jobs right now where we know what jobs they are. So what does that mean for jobs in the future when we don't even know how to define the jobs and what it is to train them for? That's kind of scary. So we drill a little further. Of these hiring managers, those who say that their students are not yet set up to succeed properly, what are they looking for? Well, they want students that are tech savvy. 88% say that's the most important thing. That's also one of the easiest ones to solve. Um, if you've ever seen a kid who's never seen a touch screen before, they pick it up in no time. Um, and, and, that's, and that's the new normal. You know, some of us uh, are a little intimidated about how we did pick it up. Uh, my wife and I are fortunate to have become grandparents recently, and we have a 21-month-old grandson who my daughter was giving him a bath and he's touching her watch and says, Mommy's watch broken because my watch is a smart watch. And so his new normal is that watches should touch and they have touch screens. I mean, this is... That, that's the next generation, right? So they're gonna be tech savvy, it's not a problem. That, that I think we don't have to worry about as much. 82% um, say they need to know how to communicate um, uh, with both uh, um, digital and, and, and visual media. This one's a little more complicated, and this obviously the arts play a huge role over here. Um, and 82% really important, and I think in general we're doing an okay job there. Um, it's uh, something that, again, kids will pick up naturally if given the opportunity. It's up to schools and educators and policy to make sure they actually are given that opportunity, and hopefully you here in the room will help that as well. 76% said what they're looking for is creativity. 
And the way they define creativity is very vague and fuzzy and ambiguous. You actually put up word clouds and see what they come up with. Um, they don't all agree, but they do know that creative thinking, being able to take a look at problems and not just follow the status quo, um, take a step back and try to figure out what the problem really is and come up with innovative ideas, that's actually what they're looking for more than anything else. Same study, 78% of managers believe that creativity is required for economic growth, even more than believe that's more valuable for society. It's kind of cool to hear hiring managers actually rank what's good for society even higher than what's good for their company. It's, yeah, that's good. Um, but still, the vast majority believe that this is really important. And this is real. This actually impacts business and businesses recognizing it. Uh, Forrester um, published a report uh, last year. 82% of companies in the US surveyed see a strong connection between creativity and business results. It's that simple. When they hire employees who are more creative, um, who, had, who have a creative education, uh, and can learn to express themselves properly, can think differently, it has an actual material impact on the bottom line. Businesses like that, right? So if we're going to um, empower the next generation, our kids to get the right jobs and be successful, um, that's good for them, good for everybody. Um, and it stopped again? There we go. Um, also, uh, the same survey said that companies that foster creativity had, in general, higher growth. Again, business loves that. And this is my favorite one, this next one. This thing every once in a while gets funny on me. There we go. This is the one I loved. Of all the companies in the survey, and there were a lot of them, of those that cultured an in-company environment of creativity, so not just until you get hired. <clears throat> you know, you were creative in school, but now you're here. Don't be creative anymore. But actually created an environment where they could share, you know, the Google 8020 as an example, or had time to play, time to create, time to experiment, time to make. Of those companies that made in on the job creativity, something critical, something core to their business and recognized it as important, 69% of them had in some um, regional or state or national level be ranked the best place to work. Creativity on the job makes happier employees. Happy employees make happy employers and happy economies. It's, it's a nice cycle that goes round and round that we are a part of and help ensuring that happens. Um, so it's no surprise that as recently as last year, 94% of hiring managers in corporations, big and small, up and down this country, said that they evaluate creativity while interviewing candidates. So who are these companies? Which are the companies that really value creativity, that we automatically think of with the names you'd expect? This next slide, I was blown away when I saw it. This is data surveyed by tens of thousands of employees who are asked, does your employer value creativity? Are you encouraged to be creative? Um, and rank the companies based on what, the first one is a pharmaceutical company. Then a car company, one of the top right is an accounting firm. I, I, I don't even know what creative accounting is. It's, 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 it's a little worrying, but, but they still value creativity. The, you know, companies, the only two tech companies on there are Qualcomm, which most people have never heard of, unless you're in the hardware business, and Apple, and Apple ranked number six. Right? So across the board, all companies are valuing creativity, see it as really important, and it's our job to make sure um, that students are, are properly prepped. Interestingly, um, among students we surveyed, uh, three quarters said that, that creativity is important in their current role, but only about a half said they felt equipped. So their managers thought even less than that, but even students themselves felt that they were not equipped right now for current jobs, never mind future jobs. I'm going to run through these next through a couple quickly. Um, educators and parents all agree creativity is important. Um, I put in the parentheses in the U.S. there because it's worth noting that that's actually something we do pretty well. We did the survey as well um, in four um, large economies in Europe and in Asia as well. And there, not so much. Parents like creativity. Educators there generally didn't see it as critical and as important for their jobs. So at least, if, if nothing else, we've done a great job letting educators know this is important. Now we just have to act on it. But in that same survey, two-thirds of parents and educators believe that the current educational system stifles creativity. That's sad. Um, so in that same survey, um, we, you know, these are word clouds. I love word clouds. You know, the, the problem with surveys is that you know, we use them to validate all sorts of things. The truth is they're useless. Because depending on how you ask a question and how you phrase the answers, you can get a survey to prove anything you'd possibly like. Right? The real fun in surveys is when they're open-ended and you ask people to fill in questions with lots of answers and then just look for the subtleties in the answers. Not what they said, but how they said it. Are there certain phrases that pop up? Are there things that they're passionate about? And then you take thousands of these and do word analysis and build a word cloud. And the larger the word is the more frequency or the highest prevalence of occurrence in answers. This is uh, results of, of um, the benefits of teachers using these tools in the classroom. Information, access, easy, technology, all the stuff you'd expect, right? 
This is the biggest challenge in getting, in getting into the school. Cost, obviously one of them, but not, not the biggest. Technology in general, the right tools, things changing all the time. One pattern that emerged repeatedly um, is that teachers worry, and I'll be, I'll be really honest here, teachers worry about looking like fools in front of their fifth graders, because their fifth graders are gonna do a better job at it sometimes than them. So how do we make the right tools and the ongoing training and the accessibility to teachers so that they feel empowered enough to walk into a classroom and give the kids the education they actually need and deserve? Um, and then finally, we asked them, what does a classroom look like five years in the future? Tablets, boards, access, internet. Uh, nowhere there did it mention um, pen, paper, paper and pencils and notepads, nothing, all digital. Last slide on this subject. We asked teachers, what do you want? If we could make life easier for you, teachers obviously know what creativity does in the classroom and the impact it has on students and how they learn. Uh, you heard those stats before about uh, um, testing scores and business now recognizes it as well. What do teachers feel they're lacking? The single biggest one said they want the tools and training to teach creativity. They don't want to do it. They just feel like they're not being adequately equipped with the tools and training on how to use those tools, going back to that point before, that they don't want to be in a classroom knowing less than the students they're talking to. Um, many want creativity integrated into the curriculum. This goes back to that, uh, uh, that point from before, um, that they don't want creativity relegated to an hour on a Tuesday afternoon, but it needs to be everywhere. And finally, they also want um, um, any uh, obstacles and um, policy um, hindrances removed as well. I have a minute left. I'm going to throw three last slides at you just where you can go for follow-up information. There is a STEM to STEAM caucus that we are part of. Uh, you should go to stem to steamorg and read about it. Um, lots of really good information there if you're helping make the case to your own schools. Um, we've got a bunch of tools as well, and I'm not going to turn this into a product pitch, I promise you. But some of the icons I put up there are things that we have deliberately made free and for education. Uh, so take a look. That, that one on the bottom right is an example. is a tool that teachers are using in classrooms. It's called Adobe Voice. It is free. Um, and it's a way to tell stories and share ideas and collaborate by using an iPad and recording your own voice. There are a lot of products like that. We've got a huge emphasis now on getting cost, barrier, and simplicity out of the way um, so that teachers can be very productive very quickly. Um, ConnectEd is the uh, White House initiative, uh, mostly for Title I schools, to put uh, billions of dollars um, in, of investment in education. Uh, we're part of that as well. There's $300 million worth of Adobe software and trading up for grabs. Come get it. Um, and finally, um, this is one site you want to pay attention to, the Adobe Education Exchange. We call it edX, E-D-E-X. Um, just look online for Adobe edX. Uh, it is the largest online community of educators talking about just this. Uh, they, it's all free. There's nothing commercial on there at all. It's not just our products. It's all companies' products. Um, there are resources. There are entire lesson plans you can download. There are examples. There are discussions. Um, I captured this screenshot last week. I needed to turn my slides in. They're now, we're now over the 200,000 mark of educators actively involved in here, and not just teachers, but anyone involved in, um, in our extracurricular activities and reaching out to kids in some way, shape, or form. Um, I encourage you to take a look, see, learn, share. Um, it's up to us to make a huge difference. Thank you.